Hello, everybody. Great to be with you this afternoon. We have a very, very special guest with all that's going on, Senate Majority Leader Mike Shirky. I just want to welcome you for joining uh, for a live broadcast to give us an update on what's happening uh, <laughs> and what's not happening in the state. God bless you, Ron. I'm glad to be with you. I've been looking forward to this for, for a week or so. Well, uh, so are we. And, uh, you know, I think that, that one of the great places for us to start is going to be to start with last uh, Friday morning. So much has happened in a short period of time, right? But uh, last Friday morning, we turned in and submitted our petitions for the Unlock Michigan campaign, 539,384 signatures in 80 days. And I'd like to get your comments on both uh, the feat, what was done by the people here of Michigan, and also just your comments on the campaign and what it's what it means today. I'm going to talk about, unlike Michigan, I'm going to talk about the role that Stand Up played in it. I'm going to do my best not to tear up because it was one of the most inspirational efforts I've ever seen in my entire life. Unfortunately, it was overshadowed on that day by a very important Supreme Court ruling, and we we're all celebrating that. But it just took a little of the luster away from what was an unbelievable accomplishment. You just mentioned 80 days. This was tens of thousands of volunteers across the state of Michigan, in all regions of Michigan, stepping up and making a driving a stake in the ground, saying that this is this has to stop. And um, I, I, I I cannot express the emotional uh, feelings I have right now because of. Uh, the efforts of those folks. And now we have before us an opportunity to drive a stake in the heart of a law that's created, that has allowed this governor, our governor, to create such havoc over the last seven months. Of course, the next step is to get the Secretary of State and her team at the Bureau of Elections to certify them. And uh, we'll talk about that process here in a minute. But right now, my hat is off to everybody that's listening and everybody that even the smallest role in collecting these signatures it's never happened before not this type not this amount of signatures not this speed and not with the passion and the integrity and the validity these petitions are almost 100 percent pure and it's just an amazing amazing feat well um and, and i wanted to make sure we took that time because last friday we did but by the time we got home from lansing we had a new decision and we were we were celebrating something entirely different which we're going to talk about in a couple minutes but for all of you out there since we're on both the stand up michigan page we're on the unlock michigan page we're on our youtube channel uh, a lot of you were circulators a lot of you were signers uh, hundreds of you joined us in lansing on uh, last week on friday um we we had a press release that was done and again it got a little bit overshadowed um, I did do some covering of that on Saturday, uh, Mike, and and uh, explained both how far we've gotten and and the uh, the uh, the barriers that we ran into that the governor attempted to do. And I just want to briefly talk about uh, uh, her attempt uh, earlier on, or the attorney general's attempt to uh, to invalidate some of the things uh, with this Eric Singer and uh, and what we found out with this uh, individual Gretchen Hertz. And I just like to get your comments on. Those uh, those those three inept efforts to discredit uh, all of the work that the citizens of Michigan uh, put out with with uh, sixty thousand volunteer signature or uh, circulators, and uh, I'd like to have you weigh in a bit on that for the people too. It's it's manifestation of how fearful they were that we were going to succeed. There was never any doubt in my mind, especially after watching all that you guys have accomplished with Stand Up from the beginning. But they were desperate to throw every obstacle they could in front of us, making false claims, actually staging false events, and then a, and then a, 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 a assigning their cause to us, and then the uh, and then this claim of somebody walking up and saying, "Can I sign my husband's signature?" She's an attorney, and uh, it wouldn't surprise me that somebody takes that video that was taken and submits that to the the uh, state bar because an attorney. Uh, probably shouldn't be breaking the law. And that was a clear, clear and unequivocal breaking of a election law. And the governor, uh, you know, she also uh, was personally involved in recruiting the UAW members to go out and create havoc for petition gatherers. Uh, but we didn't take the bait in any of those. We just step, kept, stayed focused and did our job. I should say you guys did, our, did the job. Uh, I was just, I called myself the number one cheerleader. That's what I claim. And uh, everything else was done by people across the state of Michigan. And it'll be, we're going to get some pins made up, some lapel pins, 
that say, I helped unlock Michigan 2020. They're going to be little keys, little magnets, and I'm going to make them available for anybody that wants one. Well, that is uh, incredible. And, and I have to say, um, isn't it something that we did have uh, 60,000 volunteer circulators and many more that were handed sheets and they actually couldn't find any real unlawful activity. They couldn't find any real anything to discredit what was a true <clears throat> citizens petition initiative. And we've been explaining to the people over the last uh, five or six weeks uh, that that citizen led initiatives doesn't mean that you're not working with circulators in most cases. Uh, the, the, I don't know that there's ever been an effort that has had this many volunteers who have actually done the work themselves, but it shows you the passion uh, for uh, individual liberty in the state. It shows you the anger and frustration that we faced uh, going all the way back uh, into March, but certainly in April. And um, uh, and I, I we, we not only had to talk about it, so let's move with that to, uh, they've been turned into the Secretary of State. Um, people have said, what does it mean now? And obviously we know what happened in the afternoon, but um, uh, it is it is vital that that law be repealed. It didn't change anything. All it did was prove more uh, validity that it needed to be repealed. So I'd like to hear you talk about what the process is now, what we've done so far, and what we're going to do to get this done quickly, if possible. So we're going to. I'm going to tie two thing, two very important things together. One is the topic of why it's important to follow through, and the other is the other actions. The other actions are related to this next election cycle. Uh, to double down on the importance of uh, elections and, and specifically the Supreme Court. So first of all, uh, just because the Supreme Court, today's current Supreme Court, ruled that law is unconstitutional does not deter in any way the importance of us following through and actually repealing the law and taking it off the books. And why is that important? Because a future Supreme Court, if left on the books, could reverse the decision. And uh, it would be a shame, shame and shameful for us to lose all the effort and energy and and uh, and um, organization behind getting these signatures collected. And which I'm, now I'm tying it to the second topic, and that is the selection cycle in November. We actually have two Supreme Court justices positions that need to be filled, and we have to get at least one of them filled by rule of law judges. And so there are two choices. I'm going to be very clear on who I recommend. The, the two rule of law judges that are in the race and on November election are Brock Swartzel and Mary Kelly. Uh, I am emphatically supporting Brock. I worked personally with Brock when I was uh, serving in the House. He's brilliant, and he is rock solid, consistent as a constitutional attorney. And so to we have to repeal the law so that a future Supreme Court cannot reverse the, the rule. And then a second level of insurance is to make sure we keep uh, four good rule of law uh, judges on the Supreme Court after the November 3rd election. Brock Swartzel, Mary Kelly. So and the, and the reason is, um, is that uh, uh, the, the majority opinion here was done by uh, by Justice Markman, correct? Uh, and he is uh, aged out. Is that correct? Retiring. Age limited. Yep. Okay. Age limited. limited. Yep. So he is retiring, which means we need to replace someone with uh, with a like minded judge, which uh, we think Brock Schwartzel is. Mary Kelly certainly would also be a great person. And then there is one individual justice, McCormick, who actually uh, was uh, against she was voting in the three side, would have left this law in place and allowed the unilateral use of this for as long as the governor saw fit. Uh, and she is up for re-election as well. Am I right? Absolutely. And we have to admit that incumbent judges, by and large, have a pretty good success story on being re-elected. But in this particular case, because of the highlighting and the importance of this particular ruling, uh, we should go overboard to maybe change that trend and just say simply say people should just vote. They have two votes, two votes to make Supreme Court, Schwarzel and Kelly. And maybe we can upend the chief justice and maybe she won't be reelected. It's a long shot, but at the very least, we want to make sure that we get the second position on this election. OK, so that is, uh, by the way, for all of you out there, as we start looking at calls to action, uh, we are going to be looking again as, as Stand Up Michigan uh, uh, followers uh, to basically look for people who will uh, uphold the rule of law, 
who will look for, uh, again, it, that's nonpartisan anyway when it comes to Supreme Court, but people that are going to defend our sacred values and our citizen rights and our constitutional freedoms as we've been fighting for. We saw how important the Supreme Court decision was here. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit later about elections having consequences, but uh, let's let's move on then from here. If and you don't mind, Ron, I want to I want to give you a little update. I, wanna, I forgot okay. to talk about what's next. Okay. And the Supreme, the Secretary of State, and the Bureau of Elections have to certify the signatures. Now, the signature gatherers did such a phenomenal job that there's no possible way they will fail a statistical test. But the Bureau of Elections have to go through that process. The director of the Bureau of Elections has gone on record in federal court saying their standard operating procedures to do so in 60 days. The Secretary of State has already sent signals that, well, you know, because we're so busy right now, it may take us 100 days or longer, which puts us beyond the end of the year. I sent a, I sent a very formal, very kind, but very direct letter to the Secretary of State yesterday asking her to respond to the question, okay, Madam Secretary, especially in light of this new ruling on Friday, the Supreme Court, I see there'd be no reason to, for any way to um, delay the certification of these signatures. And would you please advise us so we can plan our legislative calendar in December, please advise us what your plans are and what our expectations should be in terms of the timing of certification. And I ask her to respond in five days. And so Brown, before, you know, within five days from now, I will give you an update on whatever her feedback is. And I'll pass that along to all of you as soon as we get it. Understand again that the, 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 we were correct in that she was utilizing the law since April 30th incorrectly. We also knew that she was uh, against the Constitution, which means all of these executive orders that she put into place during that time are now uh, null and void. But more importantly, they were illegal when they were put into place. Uh, it's all the more reason when we talked about standing up and opening up and showing up during that April and May time frame, we were saying we just need to uh, not consent to this because it was illegal. And uh, many people did, like Carl the Barber was one. I'd seen a comment on here earlier that uh, Brock was actually involved in one of those earlier lower court uh, rulings That's uh, right. in regard to Carl the Barber. That shows you where the man stands. It should be all you need to know about him as an individual. And uh, most importantly, we need to understand that, uh, again, that we, we have to we have to both repeal this law, but we also have to look at the current situation and know, again, we are not to consent to uh, orders just because they're given to us by the media or the governor or uh, some uh, uh, department head that might work for her. So uh, we want to get to that a little bit down the road. But I again, we had one victory and we had a second victory. We had the Supreme Court rule. It was your legislative lawsuit. It was what you banked on all along. We didn't know how it would come down, but I want you to tell us exactly what it meant from the 7-0 and the 4-3 and how deeply they were and how specific they were in that ruling in basically calling it, uh, again, a, a completely uh, unconstitutional law being used as it is. I made, uh, on April 30th, I stood on the Senate floor and made a public statement uh, in front of the entire Senate and whoever was listening, and it is, a, it is recorded, that the governor broke the law on that day. When we refused to extend the emergency declaration because she refused to work with us, uh, she then went ahead and extended it on her own unilaterally, completely breaking the law. And the Supreme Court ruled 7-0. There was no partisanship here. 7-0 that they affirmed she broke the law on April 30th. Uh, they ruled 4-3 that the 1945 law is unconstitutional on the grounds that it absolutely uh, compromises and in in, eliminates the ability for separate, true separation of powers. And, uh, and uh, I don't know why it stood so long, uh, but it took this long before a, we had a governor of, of the character that would abuse it in the way in which she has abused it. And so thank God that you were in position you're in, Ron, that all your people in, in uh, Stand Up Michigan and Live Michigan were available and listening. And then the legislature was willing to step up and say, listen, this is not right. We have to remedy this. And so that is, that's the, the current status of those two. And then there was another ruling that said that, that uh, even though the law was unconstitutional, and this is, this is a nod to the governor. This is a nod to the governor. Even though the law was unconstitutional, uh, the court said that she didn't misinterpret it. She just she just interpreted a law properly that was unconstitutional. So there were three different rulings in that era, all accruing to our benefit or the benefit of the citizens of Michigan is what I really should say. Okay, so 
Uh, so as of Friday, we had a we had a turn in our signatures. Uh, we were basically again uh, 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 opened up and free from all of the executive orders. Um, uh, we had a, a, a short victory as we headed into and over the the uh, the into the weekend. Um, and then this this whole narrative came out, and I want to clarify this for everyone because we're still hearing questions about it. This 21 day. Uh, comment that she made that ran through the media that she had this time frame. And I want you to clarify where we sit in regards to that 21 days. We're not talking about that today anymore for obvious reasons, but I want to cover it anyway. Uh, so that was a, that was a, there was a manifestation and indication of how hard it is for this governor to give up power. It was a hail Mary. Uh, it was not in any way related to this set of facts regarding, regarding this suit and even her own counsel, privately with my general counsel, indicated that it's probably not going to stand. Uh, yet the, she continued that narrative, trying to buy time. And then she appealed to the courts in an official uh, request for them to essentially put a stay on their ruling. Maybe, and think about the absurdity of this. A governor who's sworn to follow the law and uphold our Constitution is asking a Supreme Court to put a stay on a ruling where they rule that something is unconstitutional. In other words, a governor is asking to continue to do unconstitutional things for 21 days. Uh, we filed today, the legislature filed today, uh, opposing that for obvious reasons. Uh, but the, the fact of the matter is there is no, there is no basis for this 21 day notion. And everybody, everybody knows that I think, except for the governor and uh, we'll, but uh, I'm pretty certain that the uh, courts will make a final ruling on that very soon. Okay. Well, that's, that's what we need to hear. The, the, uh, we went from jubilation as we went into yeah. Saturday morning, uh, into, uh, a, a questionable state with this 21 days. Uh, I know I went into a couple of, uh, grocery stores and other places who were, had told their employees specifically that, uh, that there was a 21 day time frame. Uh, so people bought into it. Uh, buying into it doesn't make it make it right. It doesn't make it law. Individual businesses have the right to do what they're going to do for their own businesses. But I just want all of you out there to know that that does nothing to do with you. There is no enforcement ability for that. The 21 days has no bearing, uh, no factual, no basis in law. And we don't need to worry about that. Um, so another uh, another really important couple of data points uh, around to put a punctuation in what you're saying is our attorney general uh, in general typically are aligned is aligned with the governor. Two things. One, the attorney general did not was not selected by the governor to defend her in our lawsuit in the Supreme Court, meaning that there's every indication that the attorney general even even knew way before now that this was unconstitutional. And the second thing that happened this weekend that is something else to celebrate, and I'll give her credit, the attorney general came out and very publicly said, we are not going to enforce these executive orders. So that was another point of clarity for everybody and an indication that I think this administration knew from the beginning that they were on very thin ice, uh, but yet they proceeded. Uh, as they have proceeded uh, since then, uh, I think we pretty much heard that she was actually verbally saying that she was going to, uh, she was going to uh, continue with the 21 days uh, so that she had time to basically find a way around uh, the legislature and around the Supreme Court ruling. And that is pretty much where we're at. So now we move into Monday morning. And on Monday, we have uh, a, uh, 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 we had a whole nother barrier with this whole health department issue or Sunday. And um, I'd like you to uh, address that. I would think that's the bulk of the questions that we've had here. And, uh, and, and people are wanting to know, uh, how can this happen? Um, what, what, what is the story with this statute? And what can we do about it? So the Michigan's Public Health Code that I believe is a 1978 uh, version uh, does provide for the director of the Department of Health and Human Services to be able to issue similar type orders under very limited conditions. One, to um, ensure that the, uh, the essential health care services are, remain available uh, in an environment where they may be compromised like an epidemic. And the other is to uh, rule to protect uh, citizens from, uh, you know, the effects of an epidemic. But here's the key. This this cannot stand because that's as if we were 
to declaring another state of emergency on the one that was already overruled. And so I believe this and the, the, the legislature is going to attempt to piggyback our suit already in front of the Supreme Court with this action and ask, ask the courts to opine on both. We think there's a very good chance that even this action in this case can be ruled to be unconstitutional. Well, I think we know that it will be. For all of you out there, I want you to know a couple of things. Number one, uh, I'm sure some of you have read, it's been going around on social media that that the uh, this department itself was was mentioned in the lawsuit itself because it is a, 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 a obviously a, a part of her executive branch and government. Um, secondly, I think uh, the fact that they have simply moved to do a different statute, but doing exactly the same thing with the statute and literally trying to mimic all of her orders from before goes way beyond uh, their scope. We do not believe that it has legal standing. We do not believe that there's an enforcement capability with this, meaning you as an individual having a group of people in your house or your yard, whatever, uh, there, those mandates, uh, who in the world is going to enforce those from the health department in that status? I believe, again, it is, a, it is an effort to kick the can down the road, to hold us down, and it is a, a matter for us to stand up and simply say, I am done with it. We've tried to say this to you before in May and June and July, and this is coming from me, Mike, to our people, but it's time for us to stand up. It's time for us to speak up. It's time for us to uh, literally uh, uh, throw the Supreme Court case out uh, uh, verbally to the people and say that uh, th they have no standing in this. I'm not saying in certain instances, but no health department has ever attempted this type of overreach, again, to what I believe is circumvent the same separation of powers. Uh, and I believe that she mentioned this uh, directly in her response after she lost with the Supreme Court. She mentioned the health departments in there. I believe it opens a door for us to be able to ask the Supreme Court to follow up or clarify their ruling or put something in there that the lower court, when they give their final ruling, which we hope can be swift because the people have had enough. Our businesses have struggled enough. Our individual lives have been punished enough. Our families and the risking of our children playing sports, uh, it, those type of situations and the ordering and mandates that are included in this, we literally have got to stop it as soon as possible. I got to imagine that the Supreme Court was exceedingly offended by the actions taken by our governor and the director of the Department of Health and Human Services yesterday. And this governor is not going to stop now. She's going to continue to find ways to circumvent the regular ordered legislative process, circumvent the separation of powers, circumvent our constitution. And we have to be prepared for that and slap every one of them down as they occur. She's not gonna stop. She's not going to give up power easily. And it's always been that. It's power is more important to her than serving people. And she's proved it over and over again. We should have had an indication of this back in 19 when she tried to use an emergency declaration with regards to vaping. Now, I'm not a big fan of vaping, but to, to raise it to the level of an emergency declaration and then be able to invoke uh, emerg executive orders under that banner over vaping, that should have been our first signal that that is exactly how she plans to govern. And we got to be prepared for every one of those. Well, the people of Michigan, I believe, have uh, have spoken. I think that we have stood up. Um, we have literally signed up. They've used the power of the pen. They've used their voice to to uh, to to clarify things. They're they're they've joined this grassroots movement in gigantic numbers uh, in order to claim their freedoms. Because if we sat back and listened to the governor, if we listened to the press, uh, we might as well just be in the basement with uh, with some others like Joe Biden. Uh, I'm I'm saying that because <laughs> I, I'm sorry, but it, it's where we are today. But I do want to ask because uh, so many of the questions that we're getting are constantly is what is the legislature done? What are they doing? It's very frustrating to the people out there. And I want to cover a, a few of the things you've done during the process that weren't covered by the press. A few of the things you did even in April that wouldn't be question marks now that the governor has thrown up to you. And when I say that, I mean the, the issues like you have actually voted and passed some bills that would have codified some things and given a clear path as to what we would be doing now and what the governor did on those cases that she's now acting like uh, you haven't done anything on it. So she's she's claiming that the confusion that Michigan citizens are feeling right now is a result of the legislature. 
and it is 180 degrees off. The confusion is because she has not embraced and used the legislature properly, partnered with us, giving us an equal uh, position at the table. We've sent her more than a dozen bills that in one way or another would have helped codify some of the legitimate executive orders and put them in place to protect citizens. And all she's done is either shun them or veto them over and over and over again. You know, she's making a big deal now about the unemployment insurance. We have already sent her a bill passed by both chambers to, to codify precisely what she wants to do. And she vetoed it. And so this, there's this, and by the way, the, the, the most famous one is that we sent her a bill that basically codified the nursing home recommendations from her own task force. And guess what she did? She vetoed it. And so to me, that's proof positive that she could say one thing about wanting to work with the legislature, but there's no evidence of that. Uh, we have had a couple of recent victories. I mean, we worked together on a stay, a return to school, and that was a nice bipartisan effort. And we did do the budget. Of course, that's that has got uh, is external pressure because the Constitution says we have to do a budget in a, in a certain amount of time. But there's a long list of examples where she has basically shunned the legislature and uh, even to the point of vetoing bills that essentially align perfectly with what she's been trying to do and then blame us for not taking action. Well, and um, uh, I, uh, again, I don't even know where to start with all of that. Um, uh, again, the press doesn't want to cover the issues that she does. They don't want to talk about the nursing home deaths. Uh, they don't want to talk about uh, the data and the science that have not been released to you even to this day. Um, there is a lot of accountability that is needed to be done. And I think as the, the, uh, these, the return to the equal branches of government and, and, mm -hmm. and regular work. Of course, she worked with you on the school choice because the MEA needed to make sure that uh, no matter what those school counts were, we could run back to a year ago and be able to count them all so that we would not have any layoffs. We'd be paying them in full. And I, have, I love teachers. I have a lot of people I know that are teachers. But the fact is, uh, you know, they needed to be looking out for the kids. Uh, and, and in this case, at least we did return with that decision, the power of the local school districts. Unfortunately, many of them are quickly buying into this health department regulation and rules. There have been some, uh, some schools and school boards that have spoken up and said, our kids will not wear masks while playing sports. We encourage others and for you to use the examples of those school boards and get out there and spread the word because they do not have to follow this. Uh, they have decisions to make individually and we're encouraging them to do that and think of again, what is the best uh, situation to both stay safe, but but to be able to protect our, our kids through this process. The executive orders are null and void now. Uh, the statute that we passed providing guidelines for schools for them to set up their own policies. And that's why I'm encouraging schools to do, frankly, not even beyond schools, businesses and organizations. Establish your own policies. And then citizens, and this is my, this is my uh, exhortation to all your listeners and all your uh, like-minded folks. If a business says, you know, I'd like people to wear a mask to come into this business, that is their prerogative, and we should do our best to honor that or not patronize them or not patronize. That is a local, independent, individual decision. So I'm glad that you brought that up because we need to get on the record for all these people right now. I want to hear you state that the, uh, that the Republican uh, caucus, at least in the Senate, is absolutely not going to support any kind of mask mandate unequivocally. I can't speak for the House, but I'm pretty darn confident that they are of like mind. And uh, this is going to be this is going to be the, the next big battle uh, on this. And then believe me when I say this, I'm not suggesting that people don't, they have the right to decide whether or not they want to wear a mask. And businesses have a right to determine whether they want patrons to wear a mask. But that is the decision at those levels. It should not be a stat, state mandate. You know, we began this pandemic, we began this exercise together, and there was a lot of confusion, a lot of uncertainty. And for a few weeks, we were there was some alignment. But it be quickly became quickly apparent that across the state, this nation, and this world, that people were already learning how to live with and manage their lives in the presence of COVID. And that's where we parted ways with the governor, and that's why we didn't extend the emergency declaration. But right now, we want to go back to that scenario where it is individual choices that matter in these cases.
Perfect. And, and what, and, you know, and I know our people are, are so strong. They will do anything as you saw with this unlock Michigan petition. Uh, they will rise up. They will show up. We'll, we'll, we'll do rallies if we have to in Lansing to make our voices heard. Uh, we will volunteer and we've got uh, calls to action for these next 30 days, which we've got to talk about uh, in a bit. But I just have to say that, uh, that we want to return not only the checks and balances for you, the, the legislature that works for us, we the people, but I want to return the individual choices. And I want you to tell us that you and I and I know that that was the that was the that was the plan even on April 30th was to trust the citizens of Michigan to make the best decisions for themselves because you do in fact trust us you do not need to take care of us you do not need to dictate to us you don't need to mandate anything for us or from us and I'd like to hear you clarify that for the people just so that they understand where you personally stand and where the Senate is going to stand you can go all the way back to the middle of April when I started using these words. We have two choices to dealing with this uh, COVID virus. It's an insidious virus, by the way. It's real and it's highly infectious. But we have two choices. We could go down the path of mandating and dictating and threatening people, or we could go down the path of trusting and then informing, inspiring, encouraging, enabling people. And that pathway, the difference between those two is night and day. The former is where the governor went. The latter is where the legislature believes we, we belong. And I believe, you know, most of the 10 million people in the state of Michigan agree with us. We, people can be, should be trusted to make their own decisions, but they should also be shared the information so they can make those decisions. And once that happens, I have no doubt that we will uh, prevail and Michigan citizens will show the rest of the nation, show the state and the rest of the uh, world that we know how to now transition from being in fear of this virus, to learning how individually to live with and manage it. Well, I'm, I'm glad we could get that on the record as well. I also know that you're a man of faith, Mike. Personally, I know that. Um, you know, God gives us a choice. He gave us an individual choice, didn't he? He knows what's yeah. right and what's wrong, and he knows what he would want for us as if we could be perfect individuals, but he gave us the choice. I believe that our founding fathers wanted us to make sure we had the same choice. And I'd like to hear from your heart and from you as to how you, you know, in leading the Senate, uh, look at that and say, how is it that we representing the people uh, could potentially mandate or dictate things when re really our, our job is to, to leave people with their individual uh, choices, right or wrong, they have to make choices. We cannot ever design, actually, I'm going to take that back. We could govern with a goal to eliminate all risk. But if we governed with a goal to eliminate all risk, we would end up with a society with maybe zero risk, but we would also have zero freedoms. It would not be anything like the country that we desire, the country that we love, and the country that the, our founding fathers provided for us. So every time we contemplate changing a law or passing a law, one of the first considerations is how does this affect freedom? And uh, that is a, a constant theme. And every time we uh, contemplate any kind of uh, legislative action, you can ask my colleagues in the Senate. Uh, I hammer on this all the time. And, but there's room for disagreement on some people saying, well, you did that law and it does infringe on some of my freedoms. It's not going to be a perfect situation. But when faced with a question of uncertainty, you always defer to individual trust and individual choice. And I think that that's what the people want. I, 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 we've got uh, hundreds of comments that are coming in here and questions that are coming in here. Again, uh, everyone, I have to tell you, the majority of them are just plain angry with uh, the fact that they, that they feel like, um, you know, obvious. So many have lost their businesses. So many have uh, had their families affected. They can't go to work. They've got to teach their kids from home. All of these things in the name of a virus that for the majority of us has a 99% plus, uh, um, you know, survival rate, uh, regardless of age and getting it. And I think we're just fed up with the whole process. But I do want to cover and move over. We talked about the Supreme Court, um, but we do have to have the votes in the legislature to repeal this law. Uh, we hope it certainly will get done this year. There should be no reason it wouldn't. Um, however, elections have consequences. 
and and right now uh, we have a governor, we have a we have an attorney general, we have a secretary of state uh, that are all uh, working in tandem uh, against what we believe is what we the people believe uh, in 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 regards to our freedoms. Um, uh, we do need to uh, both get out the vote. We need to uh, secure the house, and I'd like to hear your your thoughts on that and how important that is going into uh, November. I pray that we are allowed to vote in December on the petition drive to repeal the law. I can't control that process. The Secretary of State has a lot of control on that. And if it happens to bleed over until 2021, we need a majority in both chambers to be able to, to uh, complete that circle and repeal it then. The only downside to that, of course, is it delays the implementation. Uh, that's not what I want. But that is how why it's so important for all of us to focus our energies right now, the Supreme Court race and the House races. And uh, I am going to get partisan now. You don't have to, but I am. We have to have the re to retain the majority of Republicans in the House to partner with us in the Senate so we can be the, frankly, be the, the lifeline prohibiting this governor from continuing to do the kinds of things that has caused so much havoc and wrecked so many livelihoods in Michigan. So I can't emphasize enough, take the energy that everybody used to get these signatures and over the next 30 days, pour all that energy, if you will, into the house races of your choice. Ron, I've given you uh, half a dozen races and I know you're working with uh, house leadership right now, identifying where those are. I'm gonna leave it up to you to communicate to your uh, followers where best to uh, plug in. But everybody, please, if you could focus your energy that you put into this unlocked petition, unlocked Michigan petition drive, and put it into the House races to secure a Republican majority uh, come November, then uh, that sets us up to be best prepared to mitigate the kinds of things that we now know we have to expect out of this administration. So the Supreme Court, we know we have two two people up uh, or two uh, open slots. Um, we're looking for uh, Brock Schwartzel. We're looking for Mary Kelly uh, in the House. Again, we have, I believe it's two or three that we look to retain that are close, either freshmen or, or in districts that could be close. Um, we were going to, and we will again through email and through, uh, we will talk about them in lives, but we will, uh, the individual races will be providing you links. We want you to join our email list so we can uh, we can add you to that and, and we will con connect with you through there as well as our locals with those races that we need help with. We may need help knocking on doors, making phone calls, uh, texting campaigns, some different things. We are talking with some people in leadership in the House uh, that will uh, guide us into those races that need help. Uh, we are getting those people on record that they will uh, obviously vote Very important. the 1945 Very law. Important. My question is now is what Democrat you have to all go to the Democrat running in your district and say, you now have a law that has been con considered entirely, entirely, unilaterally unconstitutional. What would be the reason you would not vote to repeal an unconstitutional law because it is breaking the separation of powers act? And if you're going to separate the powers and it breaks that, then why are you running again? Why would you be a House member if you don't believe you should have a say? When you're you exactly it? right, Ron. There's no reason why when this petition ballot gets put in front of the, excuse me, petition gets put in front of the legislature, there's no reason why in both chambers, it's not a unanimous affirmation. And anybody that doesn't vote yes, uh, they're gonna be on record because we're gonna make it a record roll call vote. And they're all gonna be on record and may not affect this election, but it'll certainly affect future elections. And so you are dead on on that one. I think that what we're going to get, uh, I've always said, I think we'll have some bipartisan support when that vote comes. Uh, the reason I think we'll have bipartisan support even more now, or we certainly should, is going to be those people will be on record. And if it's considered an unconstitutional law and they're going to vote to leave it on the books, that would be disastrous for them in the future because it could very well be flipped around and it could be somebody else in charge. So exactly right. um, we're going to put pressure on them but we're gonna need our people to rise up and help us through that process. Um, so now we move to uh, uh, the uh, the Senate, of course, is not up for re-election, right? So we're not on the ballot. So right. the Senate, we have the votes, that's going to remain. Um, I just wanna see if we've got some individual questions here. Most of them are going again around uh, 
what do we believe that these people should do in regard to the health department issues? They're asking about it, of course, with school, with kids, uh, with sports. What are you recommending to them right now? And how quickly could we provide some relief to them uh, with this, uh, these decisions this governor has, uh, has, has, or the health departments have rendered at this point? I wish there were a shortcut, but this is much like our dealings with the 1945 law. It's ultimately going to have to be re, uh, resolved in court. In the meantime, my recommendation is honor the policies of the organizations, businesses, institutions, schools that they have in place. Do not get into conflict citizen to citizen over that. Make your own choice. And if a business, for instance, requires masks to go in there to be a patron and you don't want to wear a mask, go find another business to patronize. Don't let that become a conflict. Well, thank you for that, because that's exactly what I'm recommending, is uh, when I saw right after the Saturday morning that there were bars or restaurants saying, uh, we're going to continue to honor. Well, that's fine, and I can choose where I go to eat. Uh, that's, that's exactly, exactly right. our choice. But that is freedom of choice. People can choose to do what they want with their business. They decide to go to all Mexican food, and I don't like Mexican. I wanted a steak. Then I go to a steak restaurant. Look, we have freedom of choice. Uh, we need to stand up. I just want to make sure, again, that our people know that, uh, that, that we are, as a group of people collectively, our voice is being heard. Um, that, that press conference you talked about, uh, that's going to be to, uh, on Thursday, you said, in the afternoon after session. Now, we also have something else going on Thursday. I want to touch on that. And we have stand-up churches, we the people, from 3.30 to 5.30. You're going to be speaking at that event. Absolutely. And Can't wait. trying to get the churches to get involved not only in this election, but to get them to be the solution in their communities and not depend on the government as part of the solution. And uh, so I'd like you to touch on that a little bit, both as an event and also, uh, you know, wh why you're being a part of that. Michigan has a very rich foundation of churches. But there has been a problem over the last few years that churches have not embraced and engaged in this notion of government uh, like they should. I'm, I'm delighted to tell you that, that in my short tenure, I've only served now uh, 10 years, I've seen that change and it's improving. And the event that's going to happen on Thursday is another great example of that occurring. I suspect there'll be thousands of people there and we'll be all of one like mind. And that is we believe in our Christ and we believe in our Constitution in that order. And uh, it should be a fantastic day. And I can't wait for uh, to participate, to play one small minor role in it. And you're going to hear uh, those of you that are able to come to that event. Uh, you're going to hear some fiery speeches there. We've got some great pastors from around the state speaking. We have a, an, an incredible uh, patriotic choir that's going to be there. Uh, I'm obviously going to be speaking, and I'm working on my uh, my words right now. Uh, it, it'll be one of the few uh, opportunities I've had to stand on the Capitol steps and uh, and speak. So uh, I'm going to utilize those words uh, representing we the people and what that building was built on and who it was built for and who it represents. Um, I'm going to be singing as well, and I want you all to show up. Uh, I want you to participate. At 2.30, they will be practicing. If you'd like to sing with that choir on a couple of these patriotic songs, we want to have you join us there. Uh, but we want thousands of people to join, and we want them to take the message back to their own churches that we have got to have them stand up and participate in the process, whether it's helping people get out to vote, uh, whether it is uh, handling people with, with absentees or whatever, or it is poll watchers and other things that we need help with in order to secure the not only the accuracy, but the validity of this election, because there is so much at stake right now for not just our state and, and, uh, and the repeal 45 and our constitutional rights, but in our country as a whole. Mike, do you have any comments on that? We have established, Ron, you through Stand Up and Unlock have established how important it is and how real it is for people to actually participate in this notion of self-government. And not just letting representative elected officials go someplace off in place and make laws and so forth, but sometimes we have to challenge each other. And this has been a great example of that. And again, I started this conversation and I'm probably getting close to the end here, but I've never been part of something more inspirational than what I observed in the Unlock Michigan effort. So the church event, again, I see some questions here. Go to our event page in the Stand Up Michigan page. You'll see the events. You can click on that there. Um, it is uh, on Thursday afternoon. The actual event is from 3.30 to 5.30 on the Capitol steps. 
but you can see the link to that. It is Stand Up Churches, We the People. Uh, we're trying again to bring the church leadership, the people that you have representing uh, the churches in your community to come so that collectively we can speak together. We want to make sure those churches open up and stay open. Uh, we are not going to be under the guidelines of this health department. That's, again, me speaking as an individual and a representative of this organization. We are going to choose, again, you have the ability to choose where it is you don't shop, where it is that you uh, are going to participate in, and how you do or whether you send your kids to school regarding to wear masks. Those are parental decisions and decisions we have to make. The main thing that we've been able to cover, at least with you today, is there will not be mandates made by this, uh, this Senate on, in, in regards to those. But more importantly, they are working right now on exposing uh, 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 all of these things with the governor. They're looking to pass bills to be able to handle the codification of some of these er uh, areas and executive orders that don't exist anymore, but the areas within those that we need to have done for budgeting right. purposes. One other question I'd have for you, Mike, before we close is, is there any power of the purse in regard to what she's doing in order to, uh, d to destabilize or put pressure on her because she has no ability to be able to choose where those budget items go uh, individually. And I've got to believe that we have some, uh, some, some control there, do we not? We do have a lot of control, but the governor also has a lot of control in how she can transfer money. But we did have a, a very uh, firm and I believe legitimate agreement uh, when we finished this last budget. And so I don't, don't expect any drama, any of those hijinks in this budget. And then we got to start working on the next budget. But I want to go back to Thursday's event. People who attend, seek out the pastors that are there. Congratulate them, lift them up, thank them. It takes some courage for pastors to take the positions they've been taking, and it makes all the difference in the world. It does indeed. And uh, what I would say to all of you, and I know you've been seeing the data, it's been being shared here by Tammy. Uh, those of you that haven't seen some of the videos, uh, Tammy was asked, uh, Senator, to go to the the, uh, the the Capitol steps in Texas, in Austin, Texas, with some senators from Texas uh, to speak as experts. Two of the highly regarded experts here in Michigan were asked to go down there and speak in regards to these these same matters of of individual rights. And uh, and we are being looked at. Uh, and, and I want you to know there is pressure on us because we are being looked at as an example and a leader uh, throughout this country, not just Michigan, and how we react, both what our legislature does and what our grassroots chooses to do in lowering the fear uh, is is uh, is being followed. Uh, we get emails from all around this country, uh, California yesterday, uh, Texas last week, of saying to us, we want to look at opening a stand-up chapter in our state. We need to reclaim the, 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 we just don't have a singular collective voice in our state to be able to do what's right. And you're lucky and we're lucky to have a collective group that can that can speak volumes and show up. Uh, obviously in these 30 days, we have got work to do. And uh, and I'd just like uh, to, to have you close with just a few more words to, to uh, the people out here in Michigan as a whole, to the Stand Up Michigan people. And, uh, and again, just one more uh, uh, final invite to uh, the event in Lansing where they'll get to hear uh, you and some others speak. Thursday afternoon, 2.30 to 5.30. It's going to be a fantastic gathering. I've already looked at the weather. There's going to be no excuses for not showing up from a weather standpoint. We're going to celebrate our beliefs, and we're going to celebrate our Constitution. We're going to celebrate our freedoms. We're going to demonstrate what self-government really looks like and why it's important for people to be involved. And to the point of use, you and your organization and your tens of thousands of followers, Ron, you are indeed under scrutiny because you've been successful and you've passed every test. So continue doing what you're doing and God bless you. All right. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate your time and thank you all for joining. Share this video. Obviously, it's on all of the platforms. We wanted to just again continue to give you the clear and the truthful information as best as we have it. We're in difficult times. We're facing evil in some ways. I totally believe it. I think some of the decisions that have been made and, and some of the, the ways that it affects us spiritually, the way it affects us emotionally, mm -hmm is evil. I do not believe that it is of God, and it was an attempt to take away the victory and the faith that we all used together in order to accomplish the things we've accomplished today. But just to let you know, as we've said many times, we're not done. It is about we the people. Uh, Mike represents us. 
He is going to listen to us. It's why he's here speaking with us, answering questions. Uh, we're continuing to put pressure on all branches, but they are working with us. We literally have to follow the law because that's the way it is. We know in some cases it's not the law, but we just want to thank you all for joining again. We will be staying in touch with you soon. We're hoping to get Dave Coleman on here to give us more clarity on these uh, these issues with the health departments. But until next time, I just want to thank you all and we'll talk to you soon. We love you and God bless America. God bless. 